Hello, I'm Danton Supple. I'm very pleased to be at BPM tonight, talking to some of the students and some people from outside. Uh, it's a very pleasant way to finish our visit to Tel Aviv, spending an evening here. It's an excellent place. Thanks. So, so good evening. Good evening. Um, we're all excited for you to um, talk to everyone here, and we, I'm sure we all have a whole bunch of questions, but um, if you could just start just... Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started and how you got into the business. Because um, I read online you had a very... Uh, so it might seem like that. It was a very predictable career, of course. The way people had to start in studios back in the 80s was very much uh, um, a case of working your way from the bottom up. Um, starting as runners, T-boys, um, moving on to a position of assistant in studios and then moving from assistant to engineering, and then either stayed as an engineer or chose to go on into production. Um, I work as a producer. We have a studio in London based in an area called Shoreditch. I've been a producer for about 15 years, but I was a um, sort of jobbing engineer for 10 years before that. Uh, as I say, starting in studios, we were talking about this earlier with some students about there's a lot of people wanting jobs in studios and very few positions, and it was exactly the same back in mid 80s when I started. So lots of applications to the studios. Um, hopefully one of them will stick and then once you get through then making sure you keep that position through the hard work. But I did about, uh, I started off working for a producer called Trevor Horn. Uh, I was his assistant for about three years and became an in-house engineer in the studios. Uh, went from being an in-house engineer to a freelance engineer where uh, I was working for fairly well-established producers. And then after about 10 years working as an engineer, um, there's, a, there's always a situation where an artist might have been with a producer for one album. Next album, that producer might not be available. So you've already got a relationship. So that question of, do you want to have a go at producing the next one? And hopefully you're then into production. There's no very clear cut way of jumping between the different positions. It's just a case of right place, right time and uh, working hard at it. Cool. Um, you mentioned Trevor Horn, like it's, you know, Trevor Horn. Um, he invented the 80s. Yeah, I mean, he was uh, definitely the sound of the 80s. The studio, because of that, it had the budgets. It was uh, uh, it was Psalm Studios, which was known at the time for its being sort of at the fore end of uh, uh, technical um, uh, music recording. And so it was the studio to aim for. London in those days had about 60 decent studios. Nowadays, it's maybe uh, half a dozen top studios, which kind of gives you an idea of how the industry on a recording level has changed over the years. But uh, when I got a job there, I was fortunate enough to be his assistant. And as with any session, I mean, you, you learn from your experience. And so I was very lucky to be with him because a producer of his caliber will also be working with artists of a great caliber. And uh, the engineers who I learned under came from all over the world, but they're all sort of top in their in their fields. And uh, there weren't courses such as this. When I started, there was one course which would get you into studios, which was Tonmeister. And there was one university in the UK that did it. Whereas now, luckily, there's a lot more um, facilities for learning correctly, I guess, the, uh, the technical background. Um, so, and let far less studios. This, that is the slight problem. We have far more people coming through now who are very well qualified in how studios work and some of the technicalities of working in a studio. But there are very few positions to actually go to, in the UK even. And a lot of the people that uh, have worked very hard for three years, maybe got their degree in uh, music technology, one of the things about most of the big studios in the UK is that you then have to still start at the bottom. Um, there'll be those who say, well, why would I bother doing the three years if I have to start at the bottom? That's Every process in your career in this job is all learning. And I think uh, uh, if there'd been the facilities now, uh, when I started in studios, to go and do a three-year course before I actually had to worry about making a living and learning at the same time, I would have definitely taken it. I think uh, it's a definitely a great thing to have to help you as a backup once you get into studios. What changes, I think, when you go into a studio from your college course is you can learn a lot about the technicalities, about different bits of equipment, about the approaches to recording. But so much about getting on in the studio and being successful in the studio is being able to be in the same room as a bunch of other people for 12 hours a day for months on end 
So one of the problems we, not say problems, but one of the things which comes up quite often is with new people starting, especially when they put three years of their life into uh, studying, is they feel like, well, I've kind of done it now, I've got here. And uh, you need to come in and then show that desire to learn and realize the hierarchy of studios that you're still new. It does have a hierarchy. And uh, you're not going to walk in as an engineer or walk in as a producer. We're still... also, And that's not a bad thing. Going in as an assistant, you learn loads from every position in studios. As a runner, as a T-boy, you know, you're watching, you're observing from a position where you're not necessarily having to work. So you, it's great. You're getting free lectures every day. But every position and every session will be part of the learning process. So it might seem like having to do a lot of time to get to a position, but I don't think... Even bad sessions or hard work sessions, they've always offered something towards your uh, skill set for the future. I also read that you worked under uh, Steve Lipson, who presents yeah. The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, they're both very, very different. How do you um, go between working with one sort of sound and jumping to as an a engineer different well, jumping sort of as an engineer jobbing engineer you're working there was several other producers i was working with for different periods of time um it's normally their style of work you have to you know, accommodate and get used to all producers have a different approach to recording sessions how they go about it um, how much feedback they want from you as an engineer um, or do they want any feedback at all what their sounds they're aiming for <laughs> As an engineer, a lot of the time, it's almost interpretive. A producer or an artist is describing how they want something to sound. And your skill comes across if you can get somewhere close to it. You're never going to get what people picture in their heads, but being able to interpret what's being asked for and getting the, the, you know, the, that final sound from the equipment you have or the instruments you have is a um, big part of the skill as, as an engineer, I think. And uh, actually, when I worked for Trevor Horn, Steve Lipson was his engineer. So I had Trevor and then Steve. So it was really, for me, it was a great a educational pass. Um, I mean, they were a nightmare to work for, but uh, learned a lot over that period of time. And uh, all producers have a different way of working. And I see now when I'm in on projects, there's often ways you're going about doing a certain thing. And you think, well, where did this come from? And I can often sort of think back to what the source point was for that learning. And I wouldn't say I you know, had to work with bad producers, but even ones where it wasn't necessarily particularly fun, there's definitely things I learned from their approach, even if it was how not to go about something. So uh, as an engineer, you have to be constantly jumping from person to person, but you're going to be doing that for your career. Every artist you work with is different. You have to accommodate those changes. And so uh, just dealing with different producers is part of that process. I got fired from my first job after five minutes. I got um, fired twice. I was, was, song, I was so. the assistant producer of uh, Phil Ramone All right. for five minutes. And he, a guitar player played a take and it was terrible. And he yelled at him, it's terrible. Let's do it again. And I deleted the take. And he, he was like, you never delete takes. Get out of here. No, so that, never that delete anything yeah. and always yeah. be in record. Yeah. Um, there's sometimes a habit when I have engineers first, they'll be getting sounds up and the track will be running and they'll be an input and they'll be trying to get... Just go and record. Because if someone does something, it doesn't matter what the technical sound is, we can always fix it later. It's all about yeah. capturing performance. So I would say, if anyone's doing anything, be in record. I, I learned it in my first five minutes. That's a spectacularly short career. <laughs> um, so how did you make the transition between working as an engineer or an assistant producer into the actual production? What was what was your first... Um, um, I can't remember. The, the, it was normally someone I'd, I'd probably worked for as an engineer. Uh, I think I was saying earlier that there'll be a circumstance where the producer they had on a, an early project where you, you were the engineer, so they've got a familiarity with you, there's a relationship, that producer might not be available. It's like, well, do you want to step up to the plate and have a go at this one? So some of the first productions I was doing, I think I'd already worked with the artist as an engineer. And then uh, an A&R person who'd seen some work I'd done asked me if I wanted to produce a project for their label. I think at the, to start off with, I was jumping between production and engineering. I didn't just, it wasn't just a, okay, one minute you're an engineer, next minute you're a producer. I think I was sort of bouncing back and forth for a while. Um, and I still engineer a lot as a producer. It's still the, you know, it's something I really enjoy. It's something I wouldn't want to step. There are plenty of producers who don't touch a desk. It's very much interaction with the artist, it's suggestions and it's artistic direction. But so much of what I think uh, comes towards my productions is partly what I'm doing on an engineering level. 
So I tend to have uh, good engineers who are happy with me being involved in the process as well. And do you do you find production more uh, for yourself more about the the sound and getting the right sound and right I don't know like feel of the song or more the arrangement and playing? And... I think well, it's a mixture of the two, but it's always performance over everything. I think the sounds great if you can get fantastic sounds. I mean, you should be um, at this level with engineers or yourself getting sounds, which are hopefully okay. But it's it's much more about getting performances out of people, which I think is the skill set of a producer more than anything is being able to get the best out of individuals, no matter what their genre of music is, uh, being able to understand their personality and then how you interact with that personality to get them to perform, because you can't just go with the same sort of hammer approach to every artist. Some you have to be super delicate with, some you know require being a bit more forceful. But uh, I think it's it's more about uh, performances and pre-production structures when you're saying about structures mm -hmm. spending time getting that right before you go into the studio makes life a lot easier later on so we do a lot of rehearsal before we go into the studios main production process I mean you go listen to a band and you say oh I love it I want to do this or it's actually very rare that it comes from seeing a band live and thinking I want to do them that would be ideal it would be a nice way to go about it um I have a management company that look after our sort of production affairs. Most submissions will come to them. You're with 140 dB, right? 140 dB. And they'll do a certain amount of filtering so that it gets down to a, um, a smaller amount. And then they'll be sending it on saying, do you like this? Do you like this? What do you think of that? So most of it, comes. very little stuff comes in as in it arrives privately sent to me. We have a facility now via the website for people to send stuff in. Uh, which we do get certain submissions, but most of it comes via either my management company or record labels will hear an artist that think, oh, that's probably suitable for this or that producer, and then they'll approach us. What do you like better, working with a band or with a singer? Or, um... I, like, I mean, I like both for different reasons, but I like the whole social aspect of recording. Uh, it's the same reason I like recording more than mixing. It's because... You know, it's a fun job to be in, it's a fun profession to have, and it's a very social profession. Whilst you're working, you, you know, you're hanging out with people, you're having a good time, you're making music. Um, and so with bands, bands have a certain dynamic, which seems to always be the case. You come in and almost, if they didn't have their instruments, you could still go drummer, guitar, keyboard player. And uh, I mean, it is always fun being with that setup. We've done quite a few things this year with solo artists, which is very different. There's a very different sort of, characteristic they have from being on their own they don't have that support network of a band around them so you maybe have to help them with that but for me it's, it's definitely bands i like working with i like having a band set up in the studio and recording and i mean it's quite a sport position especially if the band is established and it's a band you like you're hearing your own private gig sounding probably better than most gigs because you're going through a studio and it's just yourself and your engineer who are the the happy uh, um crowd watching it so let's say you get a band that's really good and you're all in the studio and you're all playing and the songs are coming in. How do you filter the songs or what sort of role do you take in the band? Do you tell them, all right, the song sucks or... That's normally happening yeah, before rewrite. we've got into the studio. Uh, say you're doing an album, you might be aiming for 11 or 12 songs on an album. I'll always try and record 15 because you might have whittled it down to 15 and you think, oh, these are my, these are going to be the 12 tracks on the album. These are the final 12. But studios become like a league almost. You go in there and they can work on 15 tracks. And some tr how tracks, which have been on the outside to start off with, you have a particular day in the studio, there'll be a few key overdubs. And all of a sudden it's jumped into a, an album contending position. So we, I rarely go in with just the tracks for the album. There's normally a few extras. You're always going to need B-sides and um, alternative versions for release. But uh, yeah, it's not always, one's surprised me often. One's, I think, oh, I don't really see this making it. You'll have a day and all of a sudden, actually, no, this has changed now. A few key parts might go on and it goes off. But most of that's done before we go in, the selection down to the final songs. It's too much of an expensive place to kind of do your selection once you're in. What's, what's your favorite record you've ever produced? Um, they're, they're for different reasons. Some have just been a lot of fun to make. So I look back and think of certain records which have just been a lot of fun to make. When I was working with Morrissey, we um, 
I don't know, about four albums of Morrissey, and we did it always at this beautiful location. It was a big old English country house. And it was in the days when you could take three months to make a record. So it was three months of sort of party time in the country house. So that was fun. But they're my favorite records, I'm not sure. Um, there's a band called Electric Soft Parade in the UK. Not a big successful band, but it's one of my favorite albums we've made. I can't think what a favorite album is. But uh, I mean, also, then you look at ones on a success level. It might not, and that doesn't necessarily equate to how much fun they were making as a record. It's, uh, you know, the big sellers, sometimes with big artists, there's a lot more pressure to deliver an album, and that pressure can take some of the fun out of it. Um, your, uh, the things you worry about as a producer, making good songs, getting you know, things right structurally, doing good recordings, can have this weight of the uh, commercial interests of the labels, panicking about this artist's next release, and uh, it does take a bit of the edge off it. Um, I kind of want to talk about uh, the making of X, y, X and Y Coldplay's. Um, you mixed a rush of blood to the head. Yeah. And then what happened? Uh, when we mixed Rush of Blood, I'm not sure how much later it was, maybe a year and a half, two years. I knew they were recording and I was hoping to get uh, involved in the mixing again. And uh, I had a call from uh, Chris, the singer from the band saying, uh, first of all, it starts off with, I'm not sure about you mixing these tracks, which was like, <laughs> but then he said, I, I think I'd rather you have a go at producing them. So it was like down, then back up again. And uh, I started off, in fact, no, I went in to mix uh, X and Y. That's right, it started off, uh, they'd already recorded. And there was a sense slightly when I went in that this sounds kind of like Russia Blood 2. There was the sound of it and the approach. It's and, the same, same producer also. Uh, it was the same producer, yeah. But, and not in a, a sort of fault of his, but it's just the, the process was similar. And I think they were looking to have something slightly different. Uh, the way they were working was um, people, Chris was coming and laying down tracks and then people would add their parts to it. And when he said about trying some tracks, that's, for me it was about, well, I'd rather go into rehearsals because things like you know, the tempo of a song, if you write it as the, uh, as the pianist and you deliver it in that way, you're kind of assuming everything else is going to bolt on at that tempo and work. But you find that when you play things as a band, which is why I love being in rehearsals for pre-productions, you can find tuned tempos that work hearing the song as a whole, hearing it being played by a band. So there are a few songs off that where one of the reasons for changing them might have been the tempo issues a bit too quick or too slow. So I went in, I did, I think I did two songs, two or three songs, and we liked the way they were going. And so we kind of added another couple, and it just crept up from there until we'd finished X and Y. I felt the record was very different in, in the sense that a lot of the piano was changed into like a Know, like an organ sound or a synth sound or there's still a lot of piano on there i mean that is uh chris's main instrument mm. i mean with organ the big uh fix you the song on there obviously which is very organ driven but i think there's piano on most of the or a lot of the other songs what might have changed is i think the piano parts became far more simplified chris is very good at taking what starts as a complicated piano performance and constantly taking it out until you get down to the bare essence of what will convey that melody on the piano without being too complicated. So as is everyone in that, Johnny is the same thing. With, if you think of the main guitar parts, they're very simple but hugely effective. Um, just That's a question of how, how, you, how you record acoustic guitars. I tend to, you, know, you always you record that, them in the stereo. Kind of sound. Um, I tend to have two mics, uh, a mic against the body, a mic on the neck, which uh, I love the sound of. It's very open sound, very easy to, to sit in a track but it's also quite hard for the player because once you've established that mic positioning, they have to stay there and play. They can't they can move, move around. But uh, they're not necessarily the same mics you know, as in the stereo pair. It's often a mix, but invariably I'd say they were, for a main acoustic part, they're nearly always stereo recording. If it's an overdub, where you're slotting a color into a track, it might just be a trashy mic <clears throat> in mono. But if it's a key part of the song, and you wanted to have all the tonality of the guitar. The other thing is I'm never very close to a guitar. So if you're the acoustic, quite often mics could be back here. Mm. I find if I get too close, it gets quite boomy. And also you just less more, you know, that's the thing with a lot of miking. It's, it's natural, but also when you're EQing, I find with uh, <clears throat> uh, younger engineers often, they put a mic up and then come in, listen to it and then start EQing the problem out rather than going back in, just move the mic. You can do a lot of your EQing just by using your legs and moving stuff back and forth. And uh, 
I mean, sometimes with guitars, I get the mic so far away with acoustics. If they're a hard player, <clears throat> it actually looks like it's wrong. And uh, often you get guitars who keep shuffling up to the mic, thinking they've moved back. But no, sit still. You have to almost mark them as to where they're sitting. <clears throat> but uh, it's nice to know that there is a, a, an identity to the acoustics. Cause I oh, they're really beautiful. About it. They sounded like big, but small, but very personal. Well, I think that thing of being back coming back from an instrument an acoustic instrument you get to see far more of its personality and characteristics it's like close mics on the piano uh you want them because you want them to cut through tracks and have the clarity but a lot of the sound of that piano comes from stepping further back it is i mean you can be close mic'd very close mic'd on a piano and the difference between say a grand and an upright apart from certain tonalities isn't nearly as apparent until you go back a few feet and then all of a sudden that reverberation and warmth of a grand starts to come into play. Um, the other thing I really liked was, um, I, n I never heard of her before, it's Amy McDonald. Oh, yes. I love uh, the vocal Scottish. there. Um, no, she's, it, it uh, also sounded different from what I'm used to hearing. Um, how, Amy, how was, that you... was more mixing. I'm trying to think if I did any vocals. I don't think I did. Was, I think I mixed most of those tracks. Um, with that and mixing is very much a technique we use a lot of having vocal go through a number of different compressors and then it's the balance between them afterwards to hold it out the front of the track what yeah. what is it i don't know like a usual chain for you for vocals um i tend to go through phases and you kind of think okay i need to try something else um just to kind of keep up the interest but uh use a, i've got an la2a and a, a summit on which are valve compressors in the way of uh, old analog gear and then on um, plugins, I like the C4s, which are by, which I use as a, almost like an EQ. You can you can take different areas out, compress different areas out, and also uh, uh, an API 2500, which I use on vocals nearly all the time. And I always use my plugin API. I have a physical API, but uh, I find myself using the plugin one for vocals a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah and it sounds the same every day. Um, speaking of the. Uh plugins versus analog how do you feel uh, the industry's changed in the last 20 years in terms of being an engineer and a producer um what do you feel like the process differs now than it did i don't know like 15 years ago i think the, the phrase engineer is used slightly too widely um i think better plug up your uh, your equipment rack isn't quite the same as better place mics I think the art of engineering for me or the skill of engineering and with engineers that we have coming in is they've got a background in using microphones and record. It sounds like that should be you know, obvious for an engineer, but no, I mean, there's so much stuff now where people haven't had the chance to do acoustic recording, not like drum kits. They're plugging up mach drum machines or outputs of you know, whatever. But uh, I think it also is just the chance to become an engineer and spend lots of time recording, watching the process, that's not really available. Things are much quicker now. Um, budgets are tighter, you have to deliver things quicker. So it's quite often easy, I think, for people to resort to easy fix options, you know, plugins, straight over things to sort out issues. Whereas the fun part of engineering is playing with microphones and making your sounds and adjusting your sounds using the analog side of things. I love digital EQs just because they're so precise. And I do mix and match. I mean, there's not a case of our studio. We're lucky we've got a lot of analog gear in there, but there's also a ton of ton of plugins. So um, I think for engineers now, there's a lot more to learn in the way of the digital side of things. I didn't actually get to uh, everything I had to plug in for the first 15 years of my career, and you know, turn big knobs. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, I think there's probably more pressure on engineers to keep up with technical or at least software advances now. Whereas you know. It was just desks when I was younger. How do you feel um, musicians and, and artists changed? Well, I mean, well, the artists always change. I mean, John was change over time. Um, someone was asking earlier whether they're better or worse musicians now. And I, I think that would be hard to say. I think there's a, a rise recently in really high standard of musicianship. Um, a sort of the indie period of UK rock meant that a lot more people were able to be in bands who hadn't necessarily come from a technical background. And although I loved what was going on, there weren't technical musicians necessarily. I also feel, um, I remember back in the days when we used to play a mix for a client, you know, yeah. you set up the mix, you mix for a day and then they come listen, they like it, you print 
and goodbye. Mm. Um, today, how do you feel about today with mixing in the box? That's the problem it can oh, drag oh, on. When you had the budget, um, here's your mix budget, you had a day in the studio. That mix was done in that day whether you liked it or not. So you'd be working into whatever early hours to get something working. Because clients, um, artists and labels are now well aware that you can adjust stuff ad nauseum on digital setups, there's constantly little requests coming back to, oh, could you just do that mix, but could you just change um, this aspect of it? Whereas when that required paying to go into a studio for the day again to adjust something, those decisions were made with like slightly more rigor. You know, it's like, okay, it's going to cost us this much to change this. Do we really need to change it? Because you can get requests to change things, which involve dragging a mix back up, reprinting it. And you think, this really isn't a, re a change we would have done a few years ago. And uh, I'm sure if I actually handed both mixes back, it'd be hard pressed to tell which is the difference. Um, what is your take on, on you know, I think today the budgets have gone down and more and more people want to record and want to perform and want to release stuff. I want to work in the business as well. Business, work in the business. How do you balance between having less money, more work? The, the thing with budgets, and uh, they are far more reduced. Your budgets of doing albums for three months, everyone getting paid really well, doing them in luxurious this studios is just gone the time scale now is really quick but people don't have any less expectation of the final product um we we're saying this the other day about how there's no sticker on the cd that says how long it took to make so people just listen to it and they think it's either good or it's bad and so it's not that you can say well there's less budget on this i'll work this amount of, you know this less hard you still want it to sound as good as possible so i'm probably doing more hours now at my age than i was I was in my 30s and 20s thinking I won't be doing these hours in 10 years time because there's just so much more to do in a limited amount of time. I think, so, it's, a, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> People well, still maybe. want you to do stuff. They still want you to do stuff. Oh, yes, yeah, that's a good thing. But uh, budgets are hard. I mean, some projects now, you look at the budget and once you've... It's managing their expectations as well. There's this budget and, it's, and in their mind they see themselves in big recording studios. And that's not going to happen. You know, You have to make it work. And so... It's less glamorous now with the less budgets, but yeah, it can turn out well. You can just forcing the issue of having to do something quickly can focus people. Um, how, how do you fuse the work between you know your personal setup and the need to go out for you know recording drums in a proper place? Well, at one point, the studio that I have now, all the album gear is in shocked flight cases. So when we went out to record, the whole lot would ship out with the recording session. So it was your gear, but in a different environment. That doesn't happen again because of budgets. I just to move my gear, which just seemed a sort of a part of was expected, cost more than you know some budgets we get for doing a track. So the it's now very specific. You choose where you go to record certain things. So if the drums need to be in a different environment, we'll go there. We'll do a day of drums, but then we're back to my studio. You don't tend to sit in one studio now for an entire project. It's just not the budget. So you're thinking, okay, we'll be doing. You have to structure it in a far more efficient way, almost. What do we need to do in this room? Let's get that done. Then we're back to a cheaper room. You know, I used to sit in places like Psalm and Hook End editing, which looking back on it seems ridiculous. Um, so now that stuff doesn't even need to be done in the studio as such. I mean, it does. We're lucky because we have our own place. And also in our studio, we have two um, rooms and there's Pro Tools rigs in both rooms. So I'll be working on stuff. The engineer, Marta, will be working on things. I can sort of drag and drop to her rig for her to fix stuff and chuck it back. So that speeds the process up as well. I mean, you're here in Israel and our budgets are even lower than yours. We do <laughs> seven records in one day of drumming. You know, I have my drummer come in, do 12 hours. But as you were saying, there's gonna, there's gonna be merits to that as well, I'm sure. And go. Um, and I saw that you tend to use one mastering engineer for everything. Um. I've got in, you go through different people and this comes back to budgets. You know, there was a period of time when I loved using particular guys in the States, um, whereas their fee for mastering a song now can be more than we've got to make the song. So uh, there was a chap in England who uh, actually just sent an email offering free mastering as long as from people in my agency, if you wanted to try him out. And he was great. And so over the last year, he started mastering for a lot of, he did the Foo Fighters, uh, Depeche Mode, 
U2. So he's he's now established himself as a mastering engineer. And uh, I mean, mastering is a strange part of the process. As long as you don't look at it as something to rescue a mix, you're fine. And uh, the reason I like that guy is he's, you know, he listens to songs for a lot. He'll, I send him the track. He normally has it in his house for a day, walking around. And then he'll come back to you when you've sent an album. Say, I think this is your key track sonically and we'll kind of hinge the album around that rather than I've been to mastering sessions where you give them the thing they hit go and they're jumping on the top end and doing stuff and you think we haven't even heard the song listen you know, listen to it for a bit but he actually lives with it he'll actually take it in his car or take it and live it in the house and then take it from there well, at least he tells me that's what he does <laughs> Does he charge you by the hour? No, he doesn't. He charges track? by the track, so I guess he does. What is your favorite uh, chain in the process of, of making a record? Uh, I like pre-production a lot. I think the songs really come to life in before you've even got into the recording side of it. For establishing all the main things, structures, tempos, getting to know the band, getting to know the songs. Uh, I love the actual recording part. Drums is my favorite. I love recording drums. They're so varied. They're never the same. You know, I've got to, I don't think how many thousands of drum kits I've put up. But uh, you have to, it's hard work as well. And they're also incredibly frustrating. It's never that you just throw mics up on a drum kit and go, oh, that sounds great. It's always hours of pushing and pulling. Um, but I think it's a really crucial time to spend is on getting your drum sounds right because it's such a core part of a track. That, you know, that's your foundation get that all right it's much easier to hang all the other parts on if you spent time getting those right in the first place but I think drums drums are my favourite part of recording um, I mean I enjoy all parts of it depending on the the, the projects um, and I think also I prefer recording to mixing I like mixing as a mixing is a very solo occupation and I like the, the social side of recording the fact you've got people around it's a creative process you're all bouncing off each other Whereas mixing, okay, it's just the two of you as myself and engineer, but it doesn't have that feeling of making a record that you've got the band around you the whole time. Do you play anything? Uh, not often. Um, in fact, hardly ever. But as a child, I played clarinet, and then at school, I was in, and, and dr as a drummer. I play guitar to amuse myself, but I'd never get up on a stage. So uh, I spend all day long with other people. In fact, with guitarists, I fact, because I spend all my time in front of someone, I'm adjusting parts and doing things. It's just a familiarity. And so uh, quite often I'll be saying, we're doing changing things. It's been said to me, oh, why don't you just play it? I can't play guitar. But you've been changing guitar on our album for the last, you know, have. It's just I spend my time with lots of different musicians. So I'm not a player, but as an understanding of, you know, how things work and what I want to get from someone when I'm hearing a part, I can explain what I want to, to have. But no, I don't play nearly. It's like a lot of producers, you spend all day long recording other people. You don't get a chance to actually do it yourself. I spent 28 years in rooms with pianos in, and I've spent most of that time going, I really must learn piano. And it's, time flies by. But if anything, I'd say it was probably drums was the thing I spent most time playing in a band. Cool. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.